Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Lauren Imperato. She is founder and former CEO of I Am You, a 360 wellness lifestyle brand and fitness company, which she exited recently after 10 years of successive growth, profitability, and innovation. Lauren is also the best selling author of the book Retox Yoga, Food, and Attitude Healthy Solutions for Real Life. Lauren, I am so grateful to have you talk with us today about your experiences as a founder and an innovator, as well as an advisor to other companies. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So I love how you break down this idea of the the impact that story has on on innovation in create, live, and perceive. There's a lot of conversation out there about story living, meaning typically it's defined as a brand trying to create an experience for a consumer that helps them feel as though that experience becomes a story and that they are part of that story. Or even that that story living is sort of part of our everyday lives now. We sort of imagine and and envision certain stories about our lives and we want the products, the services, the the people who we interact with, the communities that we build to all kind of fit within those narratives about ourselves. Is that what you're referring to when you say create, live, and perceive? In a in a way, yes. But I think that what you mentioned um, really is focused on the living part. But I think that how a story is created um, affects not only how it's lived, but how it's perceived by the the user, the consumer, the public, et cetera. So I think that the other two prongs are actually really, really important and often forgotten about. You know, a lot of the time companies um, and entrepreneurs focus so much on the living of the story, they forget that the nuances of how it's created actually matter. Yes, yes. Well, as a content creator, of course, I am so passionate about what you're referring to. Tell me more about your experiences as a founder um, and the ways that you were able to create story around the the brands. Um, Obviously, you're an author as well, so you're a natural storyteller. Thanks. Well, you know, I think um, we often think that entrepreneurship or storytelling is one type of person or one type of company or one type of thing or another. You know, I myself labeled myself as a non-creative for many, many years. And it took me a long time to realize that, you know, storytelling and creativity comes from a lot of different angles. Um, you know, I was a literature, romance language and literature major in college. And then I went straight to Wall Street and worked on the trading floor. And there I helped start businesses in Turkey and Brazil and in the States and in London. And that was a lot of storytelling. It was figuring out how to take this one financial product or this one political movement or um, this one economic movement and tell a story that was the right story to tell for the firm and for the client. And that naturally translates, um, even if you don't think about it as storytelling, innovation, or entrepreneurship into other levels as well. So, you know, it's it kind of comes from within in a certain way. And I think that forced stories are generally at the end of the day, per- perceived that they're forced by, by the consumer or the customer. Fascinating. No, I, I love those points. And I think your background is so interesting. Can you tell us about that moment where you left Wall Street in order to pursue your own company? What were some of your fears. Tell us about that part of your personal <laughs> story. That was scary. Um, yes. you know, I, never, I never, really never thought that I was going to do what I did. You know, at a certain point I had really put my eye on um, getting really high up uh, at the firm. And there was this one particular woman there who always impressed me and I wanted to be like her. And um, I figured, you know, maybe when I was retired, I would delve into wellness as a side pro- project or, or the sorts. But I started to notice, to use your phrases, the stories being told around me and the stories being perceived around me about each person's individual health and wellness. And you have to remember that, you know, 12, 15 years ago, there was not a health and wellness industry the way there exists now. It just did not really exist um, to the magnitude, to the size, to the accessibility. And I started to teach and coach, you know, with certifications that I'd gotten as a hobby, um, my colleagues and friends across the trading floor, across, you know, different cities, you know, across all different industries. And it was there that I realized that, in a, you know, a way their story about how to be healthy was not really the reality. They had told themselves this story that health was difficult, complicated. Yoga was, you know, new agey. Nutrition meant that you could only eat salad. And mm-hmm. I went in and tried to shift that story. 
And in my free classes and teachings and coaching, I started to realize that this got a lot of momentum. Um, And over a very short but quick but long period of time, decided to quit um, this career. And I have to think it was one of the scariest days of my life, including the fact that for like the week beforehand, I just kept bringing out pairs and pairs of high heels that I had under my desk. (laughs) And everybody was like, where are you going with all those shoes? It's like, nah, it's just a new shoe wardrobe coming. (laughs) Wow. I love that visual. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's one of your final memories of that phase of your career. That and wanting to puke as I walked into my boss to tell me I was qu- to tell him I was quitting. So, so what was the vision at that point? Can you take us, you know, on that journey? Obviously, it was scary. I remember when I quit my job as well to, to pursue entrepreneurship. It was a really scary conversation to have. But tell us, you know, what what did you have in so store what I had, at that point? Um, Let's start with the foundation that I had was yoga teacher trainings. Um, I was some nutritional coaching trainings and I had not finished my official, official degree yet, but I had been experimenting with myself and and colleagues who were very willing and kind Um, (laughs) and mindfulness trainings. And I had been doing this all um, for free on my weekends and my free time in the evenings. And I had been working on clients and consumers. I had been teaching these free classes. So I had a foundation um, over many, 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 many months and seen almost like a petri dish, let's call it, of what would work and what didn't work, what resonated and what didn't resonate, what words jived and which, you know, which pronouns absolutely, you know, turned people off. Um, and as I was sitting there on the trading floor or out at night with my friends who none of who worked in Wall Street, I really came to realize that there was not a lens for health and wellness that spoke to the, you know, type A go-getter in the know, like someone that wants to work hard, play hard. They want to have a social life, a booming career, and they want to be healthy. They want to go to that best restaurant, have that bottle of wine, but feel like a billion bucks the next day and, and you know, succeed in all these different aspects of life. And that was really my portal, um, was really a mi- a way or a lens or a, a toolkit of how to keep it together in modern life, which naturally translated into a book. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's it's really built this incredible community of people who have that same vision and goals for their lives as well. I'm curious, you know, you, of course, you're an author, you, you have a background as an English major, we have that in common as well. I, I'm curious to know, now these days, when I look on your your sort of public presence, you define yourself first as an innovator, and I agree. And I think there are a lot of people in the health or the wellness space who maybe don't put that as their very first, you know, tagline or the thing that defines them most. Why do you choose to call yourself an innovator? Um, you know, to be honest, a lot of people were calling me an innovator, and I didn't um, feel it. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> I realized that in all the things I've done in my life so far and the things that I continue to do and aspire to do, they're all in an innovation space, whether that's innovating um, these small businesses that I started while I was in college to innovating the the way that the coffee shop in Palo Alto that I worked at as a first as a dishwasher, then as a bus girl, then as a, you know, cappuccino maker, and then as a register, you know, person innovating how that was done to the way I did things on wall street, the way the firm did some certain things on wall street to, you know, an industry to all the projects I have in between, you know, I've never defined myself as a health and wellness, um, person, business and innovation are, are what I like to do best. And within that, the storytelling. Yes. And you're also now an advisor for WIN, which is Women in Innovation, of course. Tell us about that and, and some of the, the the ways in which that adds to that identity well, you know, for yourself. In, innovation is, um, is an industry, but innovation is also what creates our future. And this is an amazing organization, and I'm so happy to be working with them, um, that works on helping women along in innov- innovative roles, innovation roles. So really for gender equality in the sphere that sh- shapes all of our futures. And it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, there are quite a few odds still stacked against us as women, unfortunately, um, in terms of getting venture capital and um, and succeeding in the same ways that that men can. Um, and so, I it's really neat to see organizations form to again create community, create a larger story, and amplify it around how women are also innovators can also be successful in these ways. Yeah, and I would actually even adjust a little bit of what you say, if I may. I think that women not, can be innovators. I think that they are. I think females are innately right. innovative, yes. whether it's 
you know, finding something that gets lost by our significant others or, you know, how to put dinner in a table in a different way. Like those are quote unquote more female things or, you know, things that have nothing to do with the home. I feel like we're constantly looking at problem solving in a different way. And I don't know if that's from a DNA perspective, perhaps related to our caretaking, nurturing nature that it's, you know, that has shown that, that, you know, it is, we are the, the way it evolves. Um, but I do think that we are innately and every female is innately an innovator. Yes, I completely agree. You know, I see in your writing and and in your content, you are a teacher at heart too. So I, I think it's interesting. You have so many different identities, you know, as an innovator, as a business person, as an author, and also uh, it seems as though in your yoga practices or your former studio and in the businesses that you've built, you have a heart for empowering others and teaching. Can you tell us what you've learned about, you know, storytelling in particular and how you've sort of infused that into the brands you've created or advised? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, um, we buy things, consume things, join things, share things, because it touches part of our something emotional emotion doesn't have to be like a sob fest emotion something strikes a chord and um i've always found that being real is my best voice you know there's been times along the decade of imu that i for whatever reason decided to sort of adjust my voice which would then affect my storytelling because i thought that i needed to be a different way or someone told me for a contract or a project i needed to be a mm. different way and um it never worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, and for me, being real is my voice, which is the way I tell stories. And I try and find the companies that are most attracted to work with me or advise with me are either are sensing that either they're trying to be real, but it's not, it's not coming from within, um, or they don't know what real means to them. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in a meeting or, or be or getting onto a meeting, preparing for it, thinking, what tone of voice should I take? I need to, you know, every every single factor of that's running through my head. I want to lower my tone of voice, or I want to be a little more delightful in this conversation, or I need to be strict in this conversation. I just stand my ground. Like it, it's, I get in my head so much about the way that my voice sounds and the way that my story sort of comes across in a business context. It, it really is a, such an interesting social yeah. um, challenge. Uh, yeah, you know, I actually had it people always like knock wall street and finance and the corporate world, but in the corporate world, you know, surviving on a trading floor as a female, I was just myself. And I think that's part of the reason they hired me was for my, mm-hmm. whatever it was. Right. And then as the wellness health and wellness industry went from inexistent to what it is, um, I saw how people thought that people in health and wellness, people in yoga, in meditation, in nutrition should have a certain voice. And I started my whole business and continued to grow my business because it, I wasn't trying to rebel because I'm not a rebel, but I was trying to show a different way and um, really take ancient practices and historical practices and make them legit um, and, and relating to people today. And um, I used to, there were phases in that IMU phase, a couple of years in particular, where I really struggled, like you're saying. And it just, it was just such a flop, you know, or I just hated the, the, the product at the end of the day, or I really didn't want to share it, even though it was like a business thing or whatever, because it didn't feel like me or my business. And then, you know, it really ate at me. And then I decided I just couldn't let myself be, have those thoughts anymore. And I just had it to, had to be real for what I need to be real for me and my business at that moment in time. Yes. Isn't that the dream to get to that phase? Yeah, but it's in, hard. In it, professional takes, career. it takes a lot of suffering I think, sometimes <laughs> to get there. Yeah, I think so too. Too, but hopefully any women or really any professional listening to this can know that we all struggle with that, especially in the beginning of our careers. And it's it's really important to kind of practice and really play with different aspects of your voice and, and how you represent yourself in that setting. It's really not unlike experimenting with the way you represent yourself socially. Agreed. And I think it also in that, remember that you don't have to sound like the TED Talk tells you to sound. <laughs> right. you know, or the podcast tells you to sound. I find that people yes. with, on tones of voice, people have this very similar way of speaking now and similar intonation, similar pace. But, you know, one or two organizations, corporations created that, right? And, and so we don't all need to kind of fall into that. So I think that goes back to that idea of being innovative to your true self and being real and with the story of you from the inside out. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Could you tell us more about some of the companies that you advise and uh, that aspect of your of your professional life now? Yeah, you know, I've, I, I took a long um, breather after IMU and and really stepped back and realized that what I love doing and the companies that have come to me quote unquote, organically have really been what I call um, a category called consumer touching. So people always talk about consumer goods, consumer facing goods, blah, 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 blah. And I, I realized that in an innovative sense, I, I guess, now that we're talking this out, consumer touching companies are what I like and what I'm good at, whether that is a technology that somehow and mm. you know tertiarily affects the consumer, or it is a product, like a legitimate food product or a um, accessory or a clothing brand or product. Um, it, it, I like things that touch the consumer. And I think that's partly because of that storytelling that we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. That that makes so much sense. And, and so when you're advising, how are you bringing the consumer's story and experience into, you know, the worldviews of your, of your clients or your partners? It really depends because some companies come, uh, come in or entrepreneurs and they have a very clear brand and a very clear vision. Others think... They have a very clear band and story, but you know the sales aren't working. So there's clearly something wrong. Um, and on the other side, you know, there's ones that you know really don't have any of it, don't have the brand or the story, um, but the, and they need to create one. So what I try and do is figure out the why behind um, the product, the why for both the company slash entrepreneur that's created it, and the why for the ultimate end consumer. And a lot of the times, you know the business doesn't want to hear it, right? They, they have created a product or a technology in which um, they think that it should be received or used for this purpose and this purpose only. But the better story is completely different. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of bravery, as you know, in entrepreneurship, and we've all been there who are entrepreneurs in the trenches to, to make a pivot. You know, whether it's a pivot of a product or a pivot of a pl product placement or the pivot of the story itself. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And realigning in that way or sort of refocusing your understanding of your audience or your community or your consumer, however you want to kind of conceptualize that group. You know, there's, I think there's a lot of lessons there for mindfulness, actually. And I'd love for you to riff on this with me if you're a game. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of conversation now about the role that empathy plays in innovation. And of course, we know that empathy is always central to a powerful story. You know, it's going to make you feel, it's going to make you see the world differently. And it's the same with innovation, right? If, you're, if your service or your product or your approach doesn't resonate with the people you're trying to serve, then you've missed something. And so I'm curious how, I don't know that there's as much conversation in the innovation space, at least, you know, at conferences and books and such on mindfulness and its role in innovation. Have you heard much buzz on that? Here and there a little bit, but I feel like... Um mindfulness and empathy, I consider almost different things, you know, in Tibetan sure, Buddhism, sure. There's, yeah, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a concept of um, exchanging yourself and others. So it, it and I used to teach this when I was taught mindfulness in yoga, and you can read about it in my book, I think there's a whole chapter or part of a chapter, yes. dedicated, but, but it's about putting yourself in the other person's shoes and not just the other shoes, but really in their body. almost. like, it's almost like stepping into a suit and looking at the world, perceiving the world, going through the actions with them. And that's something that I use a lot when I'm brought in to advise or consult with companies is, you know, trying to put myself in that end consumer's use. You know, there was a beauty company once that I worked with and they had this, this great product, but they really wanted it to be used by their consumer in a certain way. And it wasn't working. <laughs> And all this investor money was going out and blah, 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 all the bad things that you don't want to happen. And I came in and I said, okay, well, actually, if we look at these facts of your consumer base, their day-to-day -day, um, lifestyle, their income, um, their, their challenges, what if we actually positioned the product to solve a, prob you know, a problem of time management? And um, instead of being a quote-unquote how-you-look product, what if we made it an efficiency product? And that was a subtle way of innovation by just trying to put myself in the consumer shoes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that makes so much sense. So so I think, you know, in those ways, I, I love that practice of taking a moment. Did you say you try to practice that kind of empathy building before you, you go into that kind of strategy session? Well, I don't. I really, I do, I'm hesitant with the word empathy because I think it implies a lot of different things for a lot of people. So I'll go with, I, I try and uh, exchange myself and others and the others being not even just the, the, the company, but the end, the end user, that consumer, that company is trying to touch. 
Sure, sure. So what what about the relationship of mindfulness to innovation? Well, you know, you can't, innovation, I, I firmly believe, comes from being aware, um, from observing and then letting those observations create something in your mind. Um, so if you're not mindful, quote unquote, there's no way you're going to be properly observing something, whether that is a, you know, a um, laid back observation. So one that you don't even realize that is permeating your eyes or your ears or your nose or your mind or a very conscious observation, you know, without being quote unquote mindful, it's very difficult, I think, to even be innovative or to be creative, which is a step of innovation. Yes, I love that point. Yes, that's that's completely true. And it's interesting too, even as uh, as founder, as I know in the early days of, for instance, that that's infused into the heart and soul of every decision. And then I think as years go by and the business gets more established, it, it can become increasingly more difficult to realign with that understanding of, of your purpose and the consumer. You sometimes have to, you know, you just have to constantly have a mindset of curiosity, or as you said, observation about, about the world, about your customers and, and how to continue serving Absolutely. Well. And also, you know, uh, reminding yourself of why you did it to begin with. And everybody has a different reason for that. Um, but it can be hard, as you know, to manage expenses, income, revenues, blah, 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 investment. And, um, you know, it's hard to juggle all those things and to be mindful about all of them. Yes. With that in mind, what advice do you have, especially for those listeners who are really interested in innovation, whether that's startup innovation or enter, they're working inside of a, a corporate enterprise and they're wanting to create change or have successful innovation projects, what advice do you have for them in terms of their mindset, the way that they approach that work? Uh, it doesn't always have to be one big bang. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, <laughs> you know, some of the most innovative um, occurrences in in our history and definitely some of my more innovative innovative moments i don't even realize are innovative but like sometimes if we force ourselves or try to solve for that the right product doesn't come out it's almost like when you have writer's block and you're forcing 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 you should just get up and go for a run and and come back and probably the next day or two days later it'll come out streaming perfectly you know <laughs> yes. one of my more innovative moments on, on wall street um was actually just because I didn't like my first position on Wall Street. And I was like, okay, my skill set isn't suited to the seat they gave me. And I started printing, a, instead of telling whole stories, I started writing three bullet points, printing them out on a piece of paper, cutting those pieces of paper in half, leaving those pieces, half pieces of paper on all the traders' chairs so they would see them and be like, weird, it's a half piece of paper. <laughs> and it turns out that those trading calls were correct. And then that allowed me to move around the firm and, and get into a, a, a seat I liked better. Was that innovation at the moment? No, that was me problem solving. You know, And I think that yes. a lot of innovation is problem solving, but we try and force it sometimes. Yeah, we have this fancy word now that's it's like it's buzzy catchphrase and you know, if we throw around the word innovation and it will feel like we're doing something really, really important. Well, just like passion <laughs> was the buzzword not many years ago too, right? Well, it's yes. like follow your passion. Now it's like be innovative. You know, we we catch on to these <laughs> words and that's you know, that that is what it is, but I think there's something quite, you know, important behind it. Yeah. And I, well, I think what you were referring to as well is not to psych yourself out to kind of meet these really large expectations around some of these buzzwords. At the end of the day, if you're being curious, observant, you're problem solving, and and you're being mindful of what, what problems you're trying to solve and, and developing solutions, then sometimes that looks like a big giant idea. And sometimes it just looks like a tiny tweak that can really change. Exactly. And make a big and, you know, going back to our initial part of this discussion about storytelling, we know that by changing one pronoun, the whole meaning of the sentence, paragraph, and story can can be altered, and um, I love that. You know, as a, as a, oh, it's a constant reminder as I write that just you know one tiny two to three letter pronoun can change everything, and um, those big it's almost like sailing on a boat. These tiny tacks can make a, a really big shift in the final destination, and we should always remember that. I would love to hear about your process for writing retalks. What was that like? <laughs> You know, it started with me sitting on the trading floor and being like, God, if we just had a manual for how to keep it together in this busy, <laughs> stressful workday, it would be so easy, you know? 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, and then obviously I built the business and I wanted to have this, this book and no book had been made like that before. Um, it was the really first of its kind that combined three different facets that are now considered one quote unquote wellness, but there hadn't been a three pronged book like that. And I wanted to do that because, you know, if you have a quote a stomach ache, sometimes it becomes it's because of something you ate, sometimes it's because of stress, sometimes because of how you slept, sometimes you know, there's a thousand different reasons you can have it. So to just go to the diet book, nutrition book, meditation book, stress book, you know, yoga book, religious book didn't make sense to me. They have 20 books. They all say something different for the most part. I, and you just want to solve your stomach ache. So I decided to break down the book and, or create a different structure for the book, which, you know, was a bit re- rebellious, I guess, at the time or in yes. the, whatever word you want. Um, and really trying to break the structure again, thinking of the end consumer, putting myself in their shoes and be like, okay, I don't want to buy 20 books and read them all. I just want to solve for this one thing. And I tried to structure a book with that innovative lens, for lack of a better phrase. I love it. Yes, it makes absolute sense to combine those things. And I think it's it's really neat to hear, you know, how really the, the whole wellness, sort of the identity of influencers, wellness influencers, that's, it has so much, uh, it has so much more established identity to it now as compared to when you were first coming onto the scene in the space. Um, and so it's really neat to hear the ways in which that really broke ground to, to kind of guiding us towards a larger understanding of, of wellness and how to encompass multiple facets of it into our, our ways of viewing ourselves and our, and our habits. Yeah. And I mean, to give context, you know, when I started my business and even started, I had a BlackBerry. All my original <laughs> audio classes you can find on iTunes or Spotify or video classes you can still purchase. Those are all originally filmed on a BlackBerry or a camcorder, right? Like even that's how long ago this was. And um, did you know how important content would be to the growth of your business when you first started out? No. And I think that was a double-edged sword in the sense that none of us knew. And and I was just creating content at a weekly newsletter before every class that I taught or my teacher taught, we had to, I came up at it in a story. So let's call it, you know, a, a weekly newsletter story, the story before each class. Uh, I wrote a blog five days a week, and then I wrote for other sources. And at the end of the day, I realized I was producing, you know, a dozen, let's call it seven to 12 pieces of content a week for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just got burned out. You can't do it anymore. You know, and I just actually wrote my first public piece uh, about a month and a half, two months ago. And that's after almost a three-year hiatus. And, uh, you know, and I'm trying to approach it in a very different way this time. You know, this is an expiration. Um, Even the way I approach the social media, I'm trying to be a bit rebellious or innovative or whatever they do. I love it. Yes. I love following your work on social media. <laughs> and just, you know, I think that we, this constant desire um, to create more content, whether it's from quite frankly, a corporation, whether it calls itself a medium to small size startup or a larger corporation um, and consume content it's gotten a little out of hand because we're not really processing or thinking about not only what we're creating, but what we're consuming. I completely, I, I completely hear where you're coming from, especially so many businesses. You know, it's smart to think about SEO, yeah. but when it be, when it comes down to quantity over quality, it becomes very dangerous. When we when we leave the world of evidence base and everything is just about an algorithm, it inculcated with content that is not well thought through. It's not pulling in the insights of experts. It's, it's not even really referencing, you know, the, those research-based or evidence-based, the facts that we need to have in order to know whether that resource is legitimate or not. So there's there's a lot, I think, that still needs to be done when it comes to continuing to remind ourselves that quality is critically important. And, you know, you see a lot of advice around content marketing really just focused on how do you produce, produce, produce. Um, but if you're not being mindful about how you do that, you, you're really putting the world in a worse yeah, place. Couldn't in my agree opinion. More. And I also think though, it's so challenging because the world um, in many ways is run by a few very large platforms. Yeah. And, um, they control the algorithms completely. And that was one of my biggest frustrations, uh, you know, towards the end of my, of my time of IMU is that here I am creating stuff and then you ch- they change the algorithm or they decide I haven't created enough and then you get bumped and then blah, blah, blah. And that whole cycle, you know, so well starts. Yes, yes, and, yes. and then you get stuck in this situation as a small business, as an entrepreneur, you get stuck in this, this really moral paradox in a certain way. For me, it was a moral paradox. Do I 
dive into what these large companies um, and large platforms want me to do, which is create more despite the quality, or do I stick true to who I am and who I want my business and personal self to be? And that is a very hard line to walk every single day, particularly when the basis of reaching consumers now, whether it's reaching their minds for the, so encouraging them to think, or in my case, make them feel better, is through these platforms. You know, right. when I started also, there was no such thing as Instagram when I started my business. There were no influencers. So I had to live this whole, you know, trajectory of none of that to being told that I need to look lighter and more boobacious and soft on my Instagram photos, you know, and it, it, <sighs> yeah. And then meanwhile, you see, as you know, you see people on the other side, particularly in health and wellness who have literally no degrees or expertise in this, but they have a look that consumers like. So it just, it, it's a very, it's a very tough, you know, moral dilemma in my mind. I completely agree with you. And I, I think more, you know, digital literacy will help the world. Yeah. <laughs> and so if we all continue to commit, but the most important thing, like you said, is staying true to the story that you want to live out in your professional and personal life. And, you know, yes, you have to be resonating in order to, to, to reach people where they're at. But at the same time, if, if uh, I kind of equate it to the experience that people have uh, when they go on Survivor, you know, you don't want to be you don't want to have your story is resented and is so dark and evil that you have to live yeah. with those choices for the rest of your life. <laughs> you probably won't win the million dollars with that approach either, come to find. But it's um, hard. But it's, very, it's, it's, very hard. Anyway. it's a decision yeah. I feel like you, yes. I had to make every single day, multiple times a day. And by the way, that doesn't always win you accolades or profit or clients, but it had to, I really right. had to make it from the inside for myself to sleep with myself at night. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you do see a lot of influencers burning out for those reasons. And um, and, and so, gosh, I, it, it kind of goes back to the hope that the world can continue to be a kind place, even if we're virtual and we're removed from one another yes. like we are right now with, with the pandemic that we're all, um, we're all trying to kind of fight against together. I launched a new blog um, during this the past couple of months called Between the Waves. So between the waves.co yes. and that first piece I wrote, my first public piece in, in almost three years um, is actually about that. I encourage you to, you got you and your uh, listeners to check it out if they don't mind. Yes, definitely. Please check that out. If you're not already following Lauren Imperato on social media, please follow her. Definitely read Retox. And uh, I'm so inspired by everything we've talked about today, Lauren. It's, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Thank you for your time. Really, been it's been a fun chat. Absolutely. Take care. I'll talk soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.